we agreed to have a podium so that when he recognizes people who wish to be heard, he could look at them downwards and recognize them more effectively. But for some reason, we have been moved downstairs. So here we are. Anyway, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. This is a very special event, which we are very proud to sponsor. We have a friend and a colleague who has just recently written an important book. And this will give us all an opportunity to exchange views concerning it and the subject, much more important subject, that he also addresses. But first, let me say a word or two about procedure. After introducing Ed, he'll come up here, or he'll actually descend down here, <laughs> and give you more or less a quick overview of the book. He's not going to engage in a prolonged summary, but it is a safe assumption that maybe there are two or three or four people in this room who have not yet read the book. <laughs> so this might be helpful to those of you who are so delinquent. And after that, he'll return and sit with me for a few minutes, and we'll talk a little bit about the book. I have had the opportunity to read the book, so I'm not one of those three or four. And I do have some questions I'd like to raise. Now, beyond that, let me first of all say that, that probably this is not necessary, that Ed Lewis is really very much a figure in this town. He plays an important role in commenting about American politics. He is viewed as extremely well informed and incisive. What he, has to what he has to say is therefore taken very, very seriously. He has a significant outreach beyond the city in the country because FT is read widely, but also around the world. And he is today one of its leading commentators on world affairs. He is, as I'm sure most of you know, a Brit, a Brit, but resident for a number of years in the United States. He still retains his elegant uh, accent, which clearly qualifies him without any tests for a senior position in American television, as you may have noticed lately. And um, he has had an experience also in American politics by working closely with Larry Summers and, in fact, serving as his speechwriter. When I read his book, just over this weekend, in fact, I was struck by a thought which made me look at the book in a somewhat different perspective. It so happens that earlier in the year, I had reason to reread de Tocqueville, who 175 years ago traveled to America and wrote a remarkably optimistic analysis of American society. When I read Ed's book, and particularly the scope of his interests and his really unique ability to relate to people and to pump out of them insights which are of current significance. I thought of the parallel with the Tocqueville, but obviously also of the rather different perspective that he projects on America today. That feeling of mine was reinforced on Sunday when I read the review that appeared in the New York Times book magazine, and incidentally, on the first page of that, which is a very specific distinction. And in the course of reading that interview, in the course of reading that review, I was struck that the reviewer at one point suggested that he would have had a different title for the book. Um, time to start drinking, he suggests. <laughs> now, if you start drinking, Presumably, the end result is some sort of a state of delirium. So I wasn't taken by that title. But I asked myself, what would I offer as an alternative title? And what occurred to me was, it's time to start praying. <laughs> Which is a much more hopeful conclusion. Because prayer is designed to achieve an end effect. And a benign one, in most cases. Because God dismisses the malignant prayers. So start to, start to, time to start praying is really a more optimistic perspective on what otherwise is a very serious examination of contemporary America. So with that as an introduction, let me yield the floor down here below to you. And you can carry on f for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
That was a, an immensely generous and m totally unearned introduction, but I'm nevertheless deeply great grateful for it. Also to CSIS, uh, Andrew Swartz, Schwartz um, for, for setting this up, and of course, is this getting feedback a little bit, uh, for setting this up. Um, but there you are, there's Andrew. Thank you very, very much for this. And um, most of all, it's big for not just um, uh, moderating this, but also for, as a journalist, um, uh, making his extremely fine, nuanced, and experienced brain available to me um, and others over the last few years. Um, so thank you very much. This is a great honor. Um, a couple of caveats. I will, I'll, I'll try and summarize this in um, a short sort of 10, 12 minutes. If I go on too long, please stop me. Um, I've got a 20 minute stuck in the elevator with me pitch. I'll, I'll compress this into 10, I hope. Um, two caveats before I do. Um, the, the first is, um, as, as Big said, th I mean, this is not exactly an uplifting book, um, uh, but I don't want you all to feel suicidally depressed by the title. It's, it's not quite as bleak as the title and subtitle in particular, um, America in the Age of Descent, um, might um, imply. Um, and uh, as Big said, time to start drinking, I think is a very good, I laughed, I laughed quite a lot when I read that line in the New York Times Review um, on Sunday. Um, just, just to say that if I'd concluded with a saccharine prognosis, a saccharine ending to this book, it would have been unearned, unmerited by what, by what preceded it. And so it, it just simply wasn't merited. And I don't think it's the kind of response to the very complex and multiply interrelated challenges the United States is facing. Um, I don't think it would have been a practical way, a response simply to say, to fall back on the, the exceptionist lines that nobody ever made money betting against America, et cetera. America always pulls through. My second caveat um, refers to what's big very kindly, again, un unearned, I think, refers to as my elegant accent, which is by now you will have worked out isn't the best accent with which to market uh, uh, and summarize the kind of thesis that my book contains. Um, and uh, you know, I'm very acutely aware of the fact that uh, people from my country in the last few years, from prime ministers, um, uh, urging America into questionable wars of choice to, to historians um, uh, urging America to step up and uh, pick up the baton as the last great imperial power of the English-speaking peoples. I'm very aware that there are others of my nationality with, with different views and I just want to differentiate myself from them uh, and also to um, differentiate myself from another kind of compatriot. Um, in, the, in the late 80s when Paul Kennedy um, wrote his Decline and Fall book. Um, I'm not distancing myself from him, by the way. Samuel Huntington uh, wrote this uh, famous piece defining an American declinist as somebody who wishes for America's decline. I'm not in that category either. That, by that definition, I'm not a declinist. And if looking at my own country, Britain, and the multitude of problems it faces, um, and the fact that it is even more dependent on the financial sector, um, much more, in fact, for, for growth than, than the US, um, but lacks an international reserve currency. Uh, I, I might even consider a book on Britain, entitling a book on Britain, uh, Time to Start Sniffing Glue, because um, it's not, not, not looking too good. None of which is to say that the uh, American exceptionist nostrums are the way to respond to the problems America faces. And I, have perhaps unfairly um, picked on, um, in one or two of my columns recently, on Bob Kagan, Robert Kagan of the Brookings Institution, um, also senior advisor to, foreign policy advisor to Mitt Romney, um, whose book, The Myth of American Decline, I think summarizes this exceptionalism and why it's not the best way of looking at, um, uh, at the challenges America faces. And I, and I pick on him partly because Barack Obama made it known that in his State of the Union address, um, it was Kagan's essay that inspired him to, um, to say the line, anybody who talks of America being in decline doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, Kagan, in his book, remarks that America's share of the global economy was and has been at rem remarkably stable at roughly a quarter of global GDP since the late 1960s. 
Um, so I checked these numbers out with the IMF and double-checked them. And at market exchange rates, the, the, the accurate number is that in 1969, America had 36%. By 2000, it was down moderately to 31%. Um, but between 2000 and 2010, it dropped from 31 to 23.5. And that's a very sharp drop. And I think starting on the premise that that isn't happening is a, a kind of ostrich position to take. And barring a cataclysm, in Brazil, China, elsewhere, the, the, the rest that are growing, outstripping American growth, then America will fall to about a sixth um, of the world economy in the early 2020s. And I, I think this, is, this should be uncontroversial. So this isn't the principal subject of my book. Um, the principal subject is how America is responding to its relative economic decline and also the multiple economic challenges posed by exponential globalization, the hyper-integration of the global economy, and also by the, um, again, exponential rate of change of technology and what that's doing to the world of work and to the American middle class and to their relative skill sets against the rising rest. Um, and let me give you three very, very brief um, uh, summaries of the core points contained in this book. First is, the American economy is Latin Americanizing. Um, I think that's the best, the best way of framing it. Um, we're all aware, most people are aware that since the late 70s, since the early 70s, in fact, uh, there's been median wage stagnation. The middle class have um, failed to keep pace with, in many years, the rate of inflation, and that large sections of the middle class are very little better off today than they were in the 70s. Um, I think what's less well understood is how that process has deepened in the last decade and accelerated and become far more prevalent a mainstream fact about the American economy. Um, in uh, the 2002 to 2007 business cycle expansion, this was the first growth period on record in American history where the uh, median household income was lower at the end of it than at the beginning by $2,000 for the, for the median household. Um, since 07, of course, we've had the Great Recession. Um, and then since mid-2009, we've had now almost three years' worth of recovery. Now, the median household income during the recession went down by 3.4%, as you would expect, roughly, with a recession. Since the recovery began, the median household income has gone down by 6.7%. So in other words, as the economy has grown, for most people it's continued to be a recession. In fact, that recession has, in, in, by many measures, got worse for them than the actual recession. Um, now, a few weeks ago, uh, the two economists at Berkeley, um, Thomas Piketty and em Emmanuel Seitz, showed the kind of distribution that we're seeing in this recovery which is another way of expressing what I've just said, namely that the top 1% have taken 93%. In the year 2010, the first full year of the recovery, the top 1% took 93% of the growth from that year. The remaining 99% left with 7% of that, and almost all of that 7% went to the top decile. So in 2010 and again in 2011, the majority of the American workforce were poorer than the previous year. But the study also showed that the top 0.01%, in other words, the top 1 in 10,000, 15,600 families, the wealthiest in America, um, took almost 40% of the growth in that year. Um, and we see these trends going back to previous cycles, but it, it, each year the share going to the top of, of first year of recovery with each expansion gets much higher. It was about 45% in the Clinton recovery 93-94, it's gone up to 93% going to the top 1%. Now, if that number doesn't give you a whiff of the Latin American hacienda, I don't, I, I don't know what will, but you could look at the politics. Because this isn't just, when I say the Latin Americanization of the American e economy, isn't just confined to outcomes in the market system. Um, I think, I don't need to rehearse, we're in Washington, I don't need to rehearse the the fact we're not going to have a, a budget for the fourth year running, that we can't get um, a, a proper infrastructure bill together. 
the, the budget for worker retraining and commu community colleges is, is plummeting by about 40% um, over where it was in 06, 07, um, now that the stimulus money is running out. The fact that Washington is dysfunctional is well known to all of you. But if you look at the classic Latin American pattern of, of politics, it's a swing from orthodoxy to populism and back again, in the great destabilizing lurches that the classic Latin American democracy saw. Um, and I fear that the United States is exhibiting very much that connection between the polarization of the economy, the polarization of the labor force into a cognitive elite and then a non-cognitive cognitive elite with two very, very different responses to the global economy and the polarization we're seeing in American politics. Second, I've probably a lot taken up 10 minutes already, haven't I? I'll accelerate these two final points. Second is competitiveness. Um, now, whenever I talk to people about the difficulties, the widely acknowledged difficulties with the health of America's political economy, people say, yes, but America has the ultimate get out of jail free card, which is the ability to remain the world's leading innovator, unrivaled innovator. And I think this is true. America does remain the, world, the world's unrivaled innovator. But if you look at how it's failed to maintain its innovation infrastructure in the last 10, 12 years, and I'll give you one example, ITIF, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, rank globally on, on global competitiveness and innovation measures and multiple measures. America now comes fourth. It's not, not alarmingly low. Um, and the, the, the three countries ahead of it include people like Singapore, not strikingly um, large places. Um, but if you look at the improvements to innovation infrastructure in the last decade, uh, the 40 countries ITIF ranks, America comes 40th out of 40. So we, we are facing a new situation. And for this book, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley talking to venture capital funds, um, looking at the fact that if you, if you exclude the social media, the funding for innovation, the venture capital raising process is a fraction of where it was in the late 1990s. During the height of the dot-com boom, there was about $200 billion raised um, by the VC um, funds in, in Silicon Valley. It's never gone above $25 billion since then. Um, and part of this is, it, is it owes to the fact that there's been a Wall Streetization of the American economy. Patient capital is more difficult to raise. And talk to anybody outside the social media sector in biotech uh, and robotics, it's very hard to get startup money um, nowadays in, in Silicon Valley, or at least non-angel investor money. And I think that's an important and underappreciated point. A couple of, a couple of riders to that point. Um, if you look at the American trade deficit, um, which is back on the rise again, there's a massive, massive deficit there in advanced manufacturing products. It used to be zero in the mid-1990s, and now we're up to $100 billion uh, a, a year. That's a big, big deficit. Um, and I think uh, the flow of research and development um, is still three to one out of America than into America. These are the kinds of brain, cerebral activities that the models, the economic models, told us in the 90s America would monopolize during this new, brave new globalization period. America would be the brain. American like-minded countries would be the, the brain. And others would be the hand. And it's not really working like that at all, according to how the models would project. And the final point is an intellectual crisis. And I don't by this mean the constitutional fundamentalism of the Tea Party, the problems with an intransigent Republican Party. These are real. Um, by this, I mean the much broader intellectual crisis um, uh, that it, it includes, in particular, I think, economists. And, and what the challenges America faces pose as challenges to their world view. Um, the models didn't particularly work. The, the efficient market hypothesis didn't really describe what we saw before us in the build-up to the 08 meltdown. And yet they haven't been revised to nearly the degree that I think the paradigm hasn't been 
upgraded or changed to nearly the degree that, you know, 708 people might have been anticipating. The models told us that productivity growth leads to wage growth, um, which, of course, they haven't. The models told us that when China joined the WTO um, in, in uh, 2000, um, that the trade deficit with China would shrink rather than explode. Um, and the models today are telling us that if we pump, simply pump demand back into the economy, um, we will get back to the status quo ante. We will get back to a well-functioning market system um, that, that pre-existed the 07, 08 meltdown. Um, in the last few months, we've seen 200,000 jobs or so created a month, a little bit lower last month. But these jobs are coming at lower wages. These jobs are coming with falling incomes. The market is clearing at a lower price, not a higher price. And that is a deeply rooted structural problem that these models don't answer. So I think to some extent, America has lost a paradigm and not yet found a new one. I'll conclude not by trying to be too uplifting, but by, um, um, by making the point that a lot of people look at America's relative economic decline and either deny it's happening or deny it's important. Um, I think it's actually a product partly of America's success um, that we're seeing in China, India. The, the global commons is, has been sustained by the United States. These are larger markets for American exporters. It should be a virtuous circle that we're seeing here. But to deny that there is relative decline and that these are accompanied by very great challenges to the way America lives and works through globalization, through technology, is, I think, um, as I say, an ostrich-like um, position. And I've heard a lot of people recently say in various quarters on interviews and in public fora that America always gets through these crises. Look at the, the challenges posed by Nazism, by Stalin in the Cold War, the Civil Rights Era, the Great Depression. We get through these challenges. And America has, and it did remarkably well. And if it hadn't, the 20th century would have been a dark century for everybody. But these are very different kinds of challenges to the ones that are being posed now. They unified America. When Nazi Germany declared war on the US, it unified America instantly. The challenges posed today are dividing America and making it very, very difficult for, for America to respond um, with, with the kind of gravitas that I think Washington ought to be exhibiting, but shows no signs of exhibiting. And then finally, very, very finally, I promise, because I know I've overshot, um, is that these people who are saying we've made it through before um, are also denying there is a crisis. Um, so if you deny there's a crisis, however slow burning it might be, um, how can you come up with solutions to it? That would be the non-uplifting question I would leave it with. But since we'll be continuing, I'll go and sit over there. Thank you. Well, Ed, thank you very much. As expected, that was very incisive and also rather sobering. In, so why don't we take off for a few minutes from where you left off. In, in an overall sense, one gets from your book a real appreciation of the complexity and magnitude of the challenge the United States faces. What I don't yet fully comprehend is how you, in the final analysis, down deep in your gut, feel about what all of that implies. Ultimately, if forced to the wall, if threatened with getting shot if you don't provide an answer, <laughs> and told that if in the next several years the answer is proven to be false, the person will come back <laughs> and shoot you, <coughs> what would you say about the prospects of the United States, given the whole complex of issues that we now confront? I would say America will ultimately change its political course, that something has to give. The situation isn't sustainable. My fear is it has more to run. And time is short. Things are changing really very, very rapidly but around the world. But what will have to give? What will have to give, I think, first and foremost, and I should be, you know, as um, a practice journalist, less uh, accented in this answer. But I do think that when one of the two major parties in a system 
that is designed only to work well when they are cooperating, when the factions are, there's some fluidity up there on Capitol Hill, that when one of the two major parties is in a position of denying evidence and science um, and reasonable debate, it makes it very, very hard and, and possesses the tools to stymie um, uh, in, when they're in the minorities, as they are in the Senate still, to stymie any meaningful action. Um, then you see a Californiaization. I spoke of the Latin Americanization. Then you see a Californiaization. People tell me that in California, after the latest census, we might get to a position where what is essentially the Anglo Party, the Republican Party, is below a third and therefore can't stop stuff from happening. But we're, we're nowhere near the situation where the Republicans are being forced nationally to recalibrate um, from, I think, this, this very impractical and very unrepublican stance that they've adopted in the last few years. That's, that would be my number one. Well, now, in the course of your journeys around the United States, really somewhat on the de Tocqueville model, what is your sort of intuitive sense as to the source of this inadequacy of one of the two political parties? Is it some sort of deeply rooted prejudice? Is it escapism from the world? Is it inadequate education? Is it some sudden uh, economic, socioeconomic travails? What creates this special source of paralysis? Um, I, th I mean, I think every political culture has traits in its past that it returns to in a situation. And I think the American first, well, the Know Nothing movement, the Shays and Whiskey rebellions, there's a deep um, anti anti-elite and anti-intellectual uh, intellectual strand in American history that you can understand, um, that is very much part of the political DNA here. So there is that to reach, to reach for in times like this. But there is also, I think, a very interesting demographic change happening in America um, that Ronald Brownstein, really, uh, the journalist at the National Journal, really, really captures well when he writes. Um, and that is that in places like Texas and already in California, the white blue-collar classes, the non-college educated whites, are becoming a minority. They're not particularly served well. They are part of the middle class too, the mass so socioeconomic phenomenon. They are squeezed. Um, and uh, they're reacting by reaching for this part of America's political DNA. I do think, you know, Texas, majority of people in um, American uh, Texan schools are now Hispanic. It just went over 50% last year. Um, and the Republican Party is faced with a real challenge that gradually, election after election, that share of the electorate is going to get higher and higher. At some stage, something has to give. They can't keep willfully losing potential voters without changing, changing their course. So that's, that's a source of hope, uh, but not yet a prediction. Now, this parochialism of American society, which you also imply, what is it rooted in? Is it some sort of a hankering for a past that never really existed? Is it a self-imposed isolation in, in a time in which the world is more interwoven and more interconnected than ever before? Is it some basic failure of the American educational system to create a public that is more in tune with what's happening in the world? Where would you point to as the cause of this malaise? Uh, I mean, I think you know, people do blame Washington. They make a fetish out of Washington. Right. Uh, as if it sort of exists apart from them. And I do think um, Washington is, to some extent, the Washington America deserves at the moment. Um, if you look at who participates in politics, it's increasingly um, for primary elections and it's increasingly party activists. How often do the people who complain about that actually participate? Um, I think if you look at spending in a place like California, where people do, through the ballot initiative, have direct control and have, and have tied up their legislature in Sacramento and bound it hand and foot, um, they vote for contradictory things the whole time. Um, one example of which is the three strikes on your outlaw, uh, um, the initiative in the, in the mid-90s, which now half of American states have, which explains a great deal of why American spending on um, uh, prisons which, of course, brought Tocqueville over here in the first place, a study of prisons, um, has outstripped spending on higher education by a, a factor of six in the last 15 years in America. This is spending on yesterday, not spending on tomorrow. The budget for tomorrow uh, 
keeps getting cut. And of course, that applies writ large to the federal budget. Look at the bit that's been frozen. It's the, def it's the discretionary, the domestic discretionary non-defense <coughs> portion. Now, defense has also been hit, but all the yesterday items. How much of this sort of disappointment with government, this condition of inadequate government in Washington, is the byproduct of this extraordinary uh, incumbency, the duration of incumbency, the fact that most legislators are here to stay, relatively few get replaced in the electoral process, Corrupt, and the connection of that to corruption of money of the American political process. I forget. Was it, well, I was just looking right now at your index to look up the word corruption, and then I realized there's no index here. We, we <laughs> deliberately excluded the Washington Reed. Right. That, was, that was a chapter excluded. Um, it was, I can't remember if it was Reagan or Nixon who said that fewer elect, uh, you get a bigger turnover with the elections to the Soviet um, presidium. Right. Then, um, I think that's part of it. I think, though, that the gerrymandering you see in districts um, isn't, um, isn't the explanation you would use for the Senate, where no boundary changing is possible, and yet the Senate is just as polarized. I would point more towards people like, um, on, on the left or leftish, Bill Bishop, the big sort, uh, or on the right, Charles Murray, people who've analyzed how Americans are sorting themselves into completely different worlds, and that the super zips, zip codes that Charles Murray talks about, are, are bordered by slightly less super zips and so on. And the distance between um, uh, Americans and how they experience the world, not just the media they listen to um, uh, uh, or the way they vote, is become way greater than it used to be. Um, that, that's part of the Latin Americanization phenomenon, I feel. And another aspect um, of it is that the popularly elected elite in Congress, but also in the executive branch, is overwhelmingly representative of the 1% you talked about. That's absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, the role of money in politics, I mean, we talk, talk about how Washington's got dysfunctional. I don't know whether the Supreme Court should or shouldn't be included in that. But it does, listening to the arguments the other day, um, regardless of what your view is, whether you're pro or against Obamacare, you hear basically eight, eight people, four each on party line, questioning and one swing vote, um, which I guess is, is Obama's coming Kennedy moment, Justice Kennedy moment, um, that um, the degree to which Washington is, even the Supreme Court, the public, um, public opinion polls show it plummeting, not just after um, the 2000 Gore versus Bush ruling, but in the last 10 years, steadily going down, not to as low as Congress is um, or the presidency, but lower than it's ever been. And I think this, again, reflects the feeling that Washington is out of touch um, uh, and, and very disconnected from the average American. Okay, one final question for me. Um, how do you envisage the impact of the outside world on the United States in this context? Is it going to facilitate the needed response, or is it going to make it more difficult to mount? The outside world in, in terms of shocks, I mean, you could think of um, you know, the Spanish bomb going off in the next few months or the Strait of Hormuz being blockaded. Iran, yeah. Yeah, uh, do you mean China, in, the, in that respect? Of, but also the rise of China. Uh, I think the there is some paradox. Rabbit in the world towards the east. Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I think there's some paradoxical short term effects of this. Um, America seeks to sustain its global footprint and its bases around the world. China only seeks to extend its area of denial in its own region. So there's a big asymmetry of rivalry there. It's easier for China to do what it can do than America to sustain what it has. Um, but in the short term, that's obviously made China's neighbors very nervous. And I think has actually increased America's clout in the region. And I think improved its leverage in the short term. At some stage, though. But that's in the world. But what about within the United States regarding the problems that you've been addressing? Is it likely to contribute to revitalization out of a sense of threat or more passive resignation and indifference and ignorance, which will prevent the needed response? And one of the things I deal with in my book is the fact that there's a lot of apathetic people out there. I, mm -hmm. I can understand why they're, why they're apathetic. I can understand that the market system in votes isn't, isn't working like a market should do. If the consumer is the voter, people's frustrations are not being heard or felt or reflected in what Washington is doing. Um, I, 
don't know what is going to change that. Um, because if you, I mean, I quote, I speak to Jeff Immelt for this book, he makes the point, I think nobody would disagree with, that if globalization were put to a referendum in America, it would lose. Absolutely, it would be rejected. It would be rejected, but those, um, you know, th those are sort of gradually, the, it's sort of frog in, frog in boiling water analogy. This, is, this isn't like Nazi Germany declaring war on you. This is a slow structural set of complex problems that are very hard to produce a unified solution. Well, I think it's time to let the audience have a crack at you. So will you now s spot people, recognize them, Absolutely. respond? Absolutely, yes. Do you want me to go down or stay Oh, you can stay here. I think we're higher Please. up here than down there. I'm Harlan Ullman. My question is both for you, Ed, and also you, Zbig. Um, I would uh, counter your argument by saying that the issue is not economic, but we have a political process that's badly broken because politics are no longer about governance. They're about getting elected and doing the worst things to the other side. And both political parties have become so radicalized by the left and right that compromises out. Having said that, uh, I remember the 70s when Zbig became National advi Security Advisor terribly well, when the situation was really very, very bad. We had lost Vietnam, the oil embargo, Nixon resigned, all these kinds of things, uh, Desert One. Um, and the nation really was in a spirit of malaise, inflation and um, unemployment, and the misery index was running high. Tell me why then was not as bad as today. And even though you're very pessimistic about today, and I, I take your arguments about a broken government, and I think that's a big distinction. But tell me why we were able to recover in the late 70s and why you think we're not going to be able to recover today. Because I think, from a psychological position, this country was probably worse off then than now. I think it's a very good question. Um, uh, the country knew that it was in crisis. It wasn't responding in a unified way. But if you look at the kinds of things that were done under Reagan, pragmatic things, as well as Carter, but let's move on to Reagan because it makes my point more strongly. Um, and under Carter, I mean, the, the Bayh-Dole Act that brought the university system um, uh, into the innovation, uh, it made it much easier for universities to fund innovation because they could keep a share of the gains. Um, a, a, a beautifully pragmatic thing to do, which had a big impact on American innovation. Um, if you look at the tax reform, of the 80s, the simplification of the code. If you look at the Greenspan Commission, how Social Security was dealt with then. Um, if you look at Semitech, the creation under sustained assault from Japan, um, the semiconductor industry, which the Reagan administration agreed was an absolutely critical strategic industry. Even the Reagan administration agreed to industrial policy. Uh, and look at immigration reform. Um, I think Jim Mann is here. Um, um, there he is. Um, and Jim would be able to um, uh, elaborate on this at much greater length. But the fact is, it was understood there was a crisis. It was understood the model um, had run out of a lot of its usefulness, and measures were taken to respond to that. Where, where is that now? Some people don't even agree that there is a crisis. Um, where is that now? I think the political system has degenerated a lot further, and if you use purely political measures of polarization, I mean voting measures of polarization, you will see that it's far more polarized and therefore far more paralyzed um, today than it was then. And I don't, as I say, I would emphasize, I don't see Washington as somehow existing apart, suspended from the society that produces it and sustains it. I think it does reflect stuff that's going on out there that is very deeply rooted, very structural, and it's about the changing nature of the economy um, in America in the context of a changing global economy? That would be my answer, but it's big. Um, w uh, well, I basically ag agree with you. It seems to me that the crisis in the sort of 70s was a crisis which was occurring in the context still of a very lethal, potentially lethal rivalry with the outside world. And that was a source also of stimulus to internal responses. And in any case, it wasn't yet a crisis that was pervasive culturally, socioeconomically, as it is today. In some ways, the victory, the sort of historical victory in the great contest that took place at the end of the 80s and early 90s then produced a period in the United States 
really of significant permissiveness, deregulation, and of what you emphasize in your book, but in my view perhaps it needs to be emphasized even more, the growing social disparities between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. All of that really emerged in the last 20 years. Yeah, I agree. Yes, you were going to, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Paolo von Schirach, Schirach Report. Just also in terms of sort of historic continuum that you portrayed in your, in your earlier remarks, a question. Uh, as you have clearly indicated, the share of U.S. Uh, product, you know, uh, GDP, world GDP has shrunk more than it is uh, officially admitted, at least you know, in, in, by official economists. My question is uh, the Clinton years, which are portrayed, you know, supercharged America, things were going great. And, and of course, we can account for some uh, particular historic circumstances, the end of the Cold War, the peace dividend, the cutting down of, you know, the ability to cut down defense spending, no major crisis barring Bosnia or Kosovo that the Clinton administration had to deal with, uh, um, oil at $20 a barrel as opposed to <laughs> what we have today. And of course, uh, the internet revolution that happened, not really much had much to do with Washington policy, but it was happening, and control of public spending with agreement with the Republican Congress after the 94 elections. My question to you is, was just a, that, again, just a blip in, in what was inevitably a downward trend that we had a moment of uh, glory for the United States that was due to just lucky circumstances, and then indeed, when Clinton left the White House, we had the dot-com bust, in 2000, and we had the, nine, you know, the, the, the major scandals, the MCI, the, Adel, you know, the, the big Wall Street scandals, and then last but not least, 9-11 and everything that followed. In other words, were the Clinton years times in which we were doing the right things, or we were just lucky in, in what was inevitably a downward trend that is, uh, you know, that is continuing, as no, you described. And, and one final point is, you have not, at least in your uh, brief remarks, uh, addressed uh, uh, um, public spending much. Sure. You know, you talked about economic trends, but certainly our fiscal situation is, has become a really significant part of the problem given the weight of entitlements. You just briefly mentioned, you know, the compression of uh, non-defense discretion, discretionary spending. If you could talk about that too. Thank sure. you. Sure. I mean, I think you're, there was a one-off, hopefully not the only one-off, but there was a one-off major, major positive supply shock in the 1990s, namely the internet revolution and actually the, the personal computer revolution that had preceded it. And this had a major impact on America's bottom line in and, and on its productivity um, growth. Productivity picked up. It had been languishing for 20 years and it picked up. Um, uh, I think the stewardship of the economy, broadly speaking, um, under the Clinton administration and Bob Rubin, Larry Summers and others, um, was very responsible. And it was namely, it was the Keynesian full cycle Keynesian view, which is during an upturn um, where, when revenues are, su uh, are surging, you, you go into budget surplus so that you have funds and firepower to keep for a rainy day. Um, the trends were, there's a brief five-year blip there basically in the med med median wage stagnation problem where wages do grow for the vast majority of the workforce in the 90s. So there was good stewardship, but I, I don't think that's nearly as important a point as the impact of uh, the one-off positive supply shock, which we can't rely on happening again. Um, in terms of the fiscal picture, well, I guess that leads on, your second question leads on from my answer to the first, because of course, that balance the budget over the cycle, golden rule, was dispensed with by the Bush administration. It squandered a lot of money on tax cuts for people who had already in the 90s at their pre-existing tax rates been creating a lot of jobs and been creating a lot of wealth. On, on, on the notion that um, these are the job creators. Uh, and um, so we do find ourselves in a situation, add in a couple of wars, add in interest on past due debt, where, as I said in uh, an earlier answer, um, we've got 85% of the budget um, given to entitlements, defense, and interest payments on past due, due debt. And the tomorrow bit of the budget that includes R&D, infrastructure, education, that 15% portion of the budget is the first one everybody can agree on to freeze. Now, what does that say about the, the, the changing political climate? The, the, the pragmatism uh, that America is so richly, deservedly associated with 
is missing in action. Um, and I think the budget is, is a really good, if you had another implied question about the need to have a fiscal term, medium term plan, I would agree with that. I think we're in Washington, we know, we know more than enough about that subject. Just as a follow up to your answer, how do you feel the possibility, the consequence, what, what, how, how do you assess the possible consequences of America's involvement in a conflict with Iran on this sort of <laughs> overall <laughs> domestic <laughs> condition and the mood of the country? I, I should have asked you that question and you should now well, be I answering. I beat you to it. <laughs> how, do I, how do I assess the impact of yeah. a conflict, of an Israeli strike on Iran? Uh, well, none of America involved in it. America's involvement, and then it becomes, which would yeah. lead to it, on the mood of the country and its capacity to address some of those issues. Before or after the election? <laughs> um, well, it depends when the strike occurs, two days before the election or three weeks before or what? I no, but seriously, in terms of the overall impact of the reasonably anticipated consequences. I think that's very hard to say. I mean, it, the opinion polls show large, uh, not large, a, a small majority rather of people would support military action in some contexts to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. So it's not, it's not axiomatic that this would necessarily be unpopular for America to initially. support. Initially. Initially. Yeah. And I think very quickly this would turn into um, an anti-Iraq war sentiment squared because people are sick of war. They do want to focus on the domestic problems. They're not as terrified by the 9-11 kind of scenarios as they used to be. Um, and so my, my assumption, based on no evidence whatsoever other than a couple of stray opinion polls that are in my head, is that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be sustainably popular. But I would, I would, I would but be fascinated would it to hear your but answer. But would it galvanize um, a greater inclination to deal with domestic problems, or would it contribute to greater fracturing of any residual national unity? Um, if, if you judge, Mitt, I mean, if you look at the kinds of hostage to fortune Mitt Romney has made on the campaign trail on this issue, um, they're, not, they're not in the ambivalent language that will make it easy for him to wriggle out of if he becomes president. Even President Obama has made pretty strong commitments that, um, that containing Iran is not an option. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I do worry this could be, I mean, this would not worry this would be a very facile and divisive political issue because I doubt I doubt most of the I doubt a large chunk of the American people would think this was a good idea at all more people yeah. um, I think there's a mic hi uh, Jim man I, I let me ask you to square two things that I have a hard time reconciling in my own mind which is when I listen to my friends say that the country is going to the dogs, or when I come to that conclusion myself, which usually involves some, um, con some, something involving the transportation system, the roads or airports of this country. Uh, and I draw that tentative conclusion, and then I happen to go into an Apple store um, and see the part of the country that's working. And this is on getting away from the anecdotal level, um, a, country w a, a company that is hu terrifically profitable and is able to shell out in the last uh, couple of days a billion dollars to 12 kids getting out of, or uh, four kids, I guess, just getting out of Stanford to buy their company. You have this tremendously productive part of the economy. How does it fit in? Is it isolated? Is it linked? Um, why doesn't that part of the economy flow over and down and around? That's a, ve that's a very good question. Did, did you mean the Instagram, the Facebook yes, acquisition? Yes. Yeah. The, um, uh, there are, I don't know whether you know of Tyler Cowen's book, The Great Stagnation. He's not talking about middle class incomes. He's talk talking about the innovation revolution. And I think there are two, two points worth making here. Steve Jobs was a genius, and he was an innovative genius, and there's no downplaying that. Um, but I think that Tyler Cowen's point that we are picking the low-hanging fruit of the internet revolution, um, the social media bit is a particularly low-hanging fruit now, um, and that that broad productivity gains that you got from big leaps in former stages of American history, for example, <laughs> the introduction of mass education, to go from semi-literate, illiterate society to literate, what an enormous um, leap 
in America's um, I innovative potential um, to go from having a central government that had no R&D funding and no R&D capacity to one that has DARPA and the NIH. These were huge breakthroughs. And then, of course, the, the unification of a national economy. We're not getting those kinds of easy opportunities now to lift American growth. Um, and you have in Silicon Valley all sorts of um, really impressive companies, still very impressive companies, and some yet to be impressive companies. I've no doubt about that. Um, but if you look at the infrastructure around it and the impact of the infrastructure around it on Silicon Valley, and you look at the history of Silicon Valley and how it benefited from government largesse through the research laboratories, through the contracts, um, and through the making available lots of highly educated foreigners on easy visas, um, then lots of these things are changing. I mean, the, the last, in particular, I think most reasonable people on left and right would agree a staple act, where you staple a, a, a green card to um, the visa of this Chinese PhD student or Indian PhD student is um, common sense, the kind of pragmatic thing that Washington would have done in the 1950s, 60s. Um, if you look at the um, fact that venture capital funds are much more run by ex-investment bankers nowadays rather than people who used to run companies. The character of VCs have changed dramatically. If you look at the fact that um, Sequoia Capital, if you, you know, one of the best, um, um, has uh, eight offices around the world, of, only, of which only one is in the United States, it's not because opportunity necessarily is shrinking here, but there are all sorts of entrepreneurial innovative opportunities arising <laughs> elsewhere. So my point isn't really to knock down America's innovative potential. I mean, I don't think there's a culture in the world where you go bankrupt and boast about it like you do in America, and that's a really healthy thing. Um, but I do think that America's period of total unrivaled lead in innovation is very much becoming a thing of the past. Others are beginning to innovate. I don't think China is going to produce an Apple or uh, it's got its own Twitter, of course, but that's a copy, or, or a Facebook. But I do think if you look at the kinds of money that governments in East Asia and elsewhere are putting into R&D and doing so in very pragmatic collaborative arrangements with their private sectors, as America did in the 50s, 60s, 70s, as America did to create Silicon Valley, then America is no longer alone on the stage of being an innovator. It's not a get out of jail free card. Um, I, I guess that doesn't, that doesn't fully answer your question, but Oh, the, the distribution, well, the tax system has changed. Um, but, of course, the production, Silicon Valley only funds ideas now. You don't get funding if your idea doesn't include a China strategy. You, you don't get funding if production is here. I mean, that's, that's the absolute basic, first base template for going and seeking funding, is it doesn't include an America making things dimension to it. Please. All the discussion seems to imply that the country is in bad need of some kind of shock. I mean, um, you're implying that I Iran could play that role, but it seems that it's uh, much more of a domestic-led uh, and economic shock that the country needs to focus its mind on what is necessary. Um, are we probably talking about something similar to what is just happening in Europe? Could that focus the mind of the people? Uh, suddenly, uh, Treasury is coming under pressure because markets start losing their confidence that the country can get a grip on its problems? Um, I mean, I hear that a lot, and I understand why people say that, is that you know, Lehman Brothers wasn't enough. It didn't shift the thinking sufficiently. Um, but I, I'd be careful what you wish for. I mean, you know, shocks can produce <laughs> diametrically wrong outcomes. I mean, if you think of Mac the McCarthyite Red Scare, if, if, if you think of the invasion of Iraq, shocks don't necessarily lead to good actions. They do sometimes. I mean, the 30s is, of course, a primary example of bold, persistent experimentation. It, 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 exp experimentation, um, incidentally, which included at its core what will happen to human beings. What are they going to do? How are we going to employ them? I feel we, we conduct debates now at slightly higher altitude, um, uh, and, um, but that's uh, uh, irrelevant to your question. Some kind, of, uh, some kind of a jolt 
to the way people think about this is going to be necessary because this is a long process we're in. It is something we're gradually, we're way more acclimatized to than we think we are. Yes, um, sleepwalking is another word I use. And of course, that would imply somebody you know, giving you a prod or electric shock. Um, but I, I, would, I would hate to w wish for a shot, you know, Hurricane Katrina times five or whatever it might be that people in the environmental movement wish for to shock America and others back to a global warming sensibility. I would hate to wish for that equivalent in the broader geopolitical competitiveness space I'm talking about because I dread to think, I dread to think what it might be and whether it would <coughs> induce the right rethinking. I think people have got to do it themselves. We have time for one more. I'd, sorry, one more. Um, Sir. Uh, yes, uh, sitting, sitting just here. Mm. The two microphones, a duet, a duet to the back. Uh, Tom Mann's back. Uh, to what extent do you think that this is precipitated by the rush to the bottom line, uh, that our industry no longer looks to the future, it looks to the next quarter? Uh, all you have to do is look at how the drug industry has changed. It buys new companies. It doesn't do any research itself. Uh, it goes to China. It doesn't think about long-term stuff. Uh, I wonder how NAFTA fits into that. Um, much more complicated, but I'm most interested in the rush to the bottom line and the role of Wall Street in all this. It's a very good question. I mean, one of the numbers that, um, that is often cited is that the American private sector spends, I'm not sure whether I'm a year out of date now, but spent last, the last year, I remember the number for $330 billion on research and development. A lot of money. And that's bigger you know, than the R&D government budgets of many of the big Asian countries, way bigger. Um, but if you look at what this involved, a lot of it is routinized bureaucratic activity. This isn't basic research. This isn't scientific research. And uh, Alcatel, which took over Bell Labs when it took over AT, that bit of AT&T, um, uh, recently converted Bell Labs into a normal corporate R&D center. And we won't be hearing any from, anything from it for, again, I, I don't think, because that's not what normal corporate R&D is about. Um, so the basic sort of serendipitous research that produces breakthroughs is not what most corporate R&D is going to. And the reason for that is because the time horizons um, that Bell Labs had, that they had to uh, make all the amazing Nobel Prize winning breakthroughs they made in the 60s, 70s, uh, just don't exist for a normal corporation. The pressure to justify you know, spending $200 million on something that might five, 10 years from now produce a breakthrough, only the pharmaceutical sector can do. And as you've pointed out, it's changed its strategy, which is now to gobble up small companies. It's basically, it's a boa constrictor and it swallows things. Um, and these small companies don't go to market anymore. They don't have IPOs. These VC-funded biotech companies are created expressly with the purpose of being acquired. And the acquisition kills the entrepreneurialism straight away. It's, the, a lot of this is under the radar. And a lot of this is what my book addresses. Um, but your question is absolutely right. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, you are, you're putting your thumb on a very important problem with the time horizons um, of most of corporate America. Not all of corporate America, but most of it. Well, I'm sorry that time doesn't permit us to accommodate everyone who has signaled that they would like to raise an issue. But let me say simply in thanking Ed for this incisive discussion that I think he has demonstrated to us very effectively the correctness of his title, Time to Start Thinking. This was very much part of that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks a lot. For that. That was, um, and that was. there are refreshments, and I take it you're, going, you're willing to mingle, so if anyone Absolutely, wishes. yes. But, um, let me turn this off. Thank you. It was really good. Well, you, I'm delighted to do it. It was really good. It was a good session. <laughs>